Uh, so Sean Simpson, uh, thanks for your time first of all. Um, so we'll start uh, where it all began really. Back in the days you were racing in Ireland. Back then if somebody had it told you, you'd go on to be a factory a factory rider in the GP paddock, win GPs. First of all, would you have believed it? And second of all, you must be very proud of what you achieved in the sport. Yeah, I think, you know, growing up from, being from Scotland, we're always very far away from uh, from the main racing down in England. And my dad was obviously a um, top world championship rider, British championship rider. And then when I was born, he still liked to ride Scottish championship level, still done a couple of GPs, even as late as 95 um, down in Vernon Mountain in Cork. So I always went with him, but I wasn't really allowed to race until I was 13 properly. So he kind of held me back a little bit, which I think was great. Um, I needed to show him that I was motivated to ride. Come home, wash my own bike, you know, take care of my own stuff, make sure the van was loaded to go ride in the next time. And without that input, my dad would have just not, not let me do it. So coming from that sort of upbringing, probably in the back of my mind thought it would never happen really. Always knew I liked riding bikes, could ride very well. Definitely was never one of the most talented guys on a bike. Um, and even further on in my career, you would, you would easily say that I was more of a grafter than someone who, who it naturally came to. So um, deep down, I probably hoped it would happen, that one day I would be on the world stage and I could win GPs and, and battle with the best riders in, in Europe or in the world even. And, uh, but there was plenty of hurdles along the road that, that really held us up and, and uh, tough times, injuries, looking for rides, trying to make money. Um, but overall, looking back on the career I've had now, you know, nearly 20 years at the top end of the sport, um, pretty impressive. And you were with Roger McGee for a number of years, he obviously believed in you, you were Kawasaki Honda, but then they made the switch to the KTM, and that was the year it all clicked for you. You might not have won a GP that year, but pretty much every racetrack you were very, very consistent, and that led to fourth in the world. What do you think it was that the click for you that year and were you surprised yourself at how much you improved that year to finish fourth in the world pretty unbelievable I don't think going into the season that was on the card really yeah well Roger started the team for me in 2005 um, I'd been previously riding for the Chambers KTM team and, and that that didn't work out for us for 2005 so Roger started the team and, and very quickly we had a race truck and we were going to GPs and it was a steep learning curve. Um, the very first GP we went to in 2005 was Bel Puge in Spain and I never never qualified. But Roger wasn't phased, he said let's go to Portugal and try our luck again there and I qualified and every other GP that year I qualified. Um, so going from that to then, that was my first year, Team Lizard Honda. Second year was with Gordon Crockard. We tried to elevate the team a little bit more with Gordon and, and some better parts and stuff on the bike, but we had a lot of bad luck that year. The Kawasaki for me was a turning point because we could, got, we could get quite a bit more power out of the bike. And although I had a bit of a disastrous year, very up and down, there was moments of brilliance there that I hadn't seen from myself before. I had a couple of seventh place finishes and there was even one race I crashed at the start and I was actually a lap down but I sat behind Andrew McFarlane for nearly all moto and he was lying fourth place in the race. So that was when it sort of twigged to me that, you know, I can run this pace. You know, if the bike's right, suspension's good and I feel good, I can really do this. And that's the mentality I used going into 2008 on the KTM. I just felt so at home on the bike. We'd done very little to the suspension. We didn't. We, we tried our best with the engine to get it competitive and straight out the bat I just I couldn't get a bad start on that bike I couldn't really feel unsafe on the track and riding at that level having that amount of safety and confidence in your bike that just totally elevated me from being like a 10th to 15th guy straight up to being in the top five every single moto nearly and and that's that's where I then became you know in my opinion, you know, one of the championship contenders for the following year. And then I went on to ride for factory Red Bull K KTM. Well, that's my next question. Obviously, you get started to get attention with your results. Factory KTM come calling. Obviously, there's a lot of expectation when you get signed for factory KTM. When they sign you at that age, you know, they're signing you to win the title probably, or at yeah. least the challenge for the title. Obviously, from the outside, it's easy to say you were under pressure, and that was probably the first time you were in that situation. But how did you find being part of the team and 
did you take it all in your stride? I'm sure there was difficult times, but how do you think, feel you dealt with it and, and being part of the team and obviously just seeing how things were done at factory level yeah. must have been an eye opener as well. I mean, I'm a pretty humble guy and, and nothing really phases me that much, but there was a lot going on, um, a lot of new parts, a lot of shiny stuff, um, a lot of things to test. Um, a lot of people running around you, which was very unusual for me, because you know up until that point it had only been me. My dad took care of the suspension and the engines, and my brother took took care of everything else, um, and took care of most of the things on GP weekend as well. So going from that, being taken away from them for a short time, they, later they got involved again. But it was um, it was it was an eye opener. I tried to take it as much in my stride as I could, but straight away in 2009, I just did not feel nearly as comfortable on the bike as I did in 2008. We had a bit more power with the factory engine, which I loved, but the handling I just I just couldn't feel 100% safe. And we went into the first three GPs that year, and me and Rui Gonçalves, my teammate and MX2 at that point, we just we just were struggling. You know, we were between 10th and 15th in a couple of races, and. I remember having a meeting with the guys and saying, like, Pitt Byra said, well, what's the, what's happening here, guys? We're really struggling. And we sat down, wrote a big list, and that's when we brought my bro brother back into the into the frame to kind of get a bit of familiar familiarity there. Um, and from there, we made quite good progress over the next couple of weeks to the point where me and Rui were both on the podium in Valkensvard. And then, unfortunately, I, I had a massive crash the next uh, the next Wednesday, there bounce, I think it yeah, was, wasn't it? Smashed, yeah. smashed how, into a tree. How difficult was it dealing with that just when you had made a little bit of progress and you know you could have turned the season around? That must have been hard to deal with, especially well, getting a factory ride. You know, you had everything and then for that to happen, it must have been a big blow. I think I had the security of a two year contract. That was in my mind. I said, okay, like this year is done. I will be back for a few races at the end of the year because this was a serious smash. I was going to be out for more than three months. So that's the season gone. Um, but I had the security of a second year on my contract, so that was good. Um, it was quite uh, an injury to overcome. Broke my tibia and fibula on my left leg. Uh, tibia and fibula, I get that right, because it annoys me when people get it wrong. Um, and then, you know, you know, it really took a long time to come back. And then I tried coming back at the end of the season. Still wasn't feeling 100% great with the bike because they put me on the new linkage bike. So from 09 to 10, that's when KTM designed their linkage and, and I was their test pilot for that to get some hours on it and, and try and get some feedback going into the next year for the because Marvin obviously came into the team and I, I didn't feel I felt it probably even worse with the new linkage bike than I did with the, the PDS uh, factory bike so I struggled really a lot towards the end of that year and then uh, yeah, the following year was was really good. Had a lot of good starts and a, a lot of good finishes, but nothing that was really warranting of uh, the team, the bike, or myself. And there was, you know, unbeknownst to me at that point, I had an underlying health issue that I uh, that I couldn't that I couldn't understand why it wasn't showing up on any blood tests or anything. And once we figured that out, um, you know, a couple of years later, in fact, that's when. Uh, you know, my fitness and stuff really started coming on. I was known for being the guy who could go the longest in the races, but in 2010, I could barely string 10 minutes together without being completely knackered. So, yeah, 2009 and 2010 are definitely the two years of my career that I look back and think what could have been. Um, it definitely wasn't a waste. I learned a lot, um, grew up a lot, um, but there certainly could have been a lot more came out of those two years. And then obviously going to the MXGP, a new chapter, let's say, um, obviously you signed, I think you had quite a few offers on the table, in the end you decided to go with LS Motors. I guess being a Belgian team and you were set up in Belgium then, that kind of made sense. How was it being, how did you find being with that team? I think I remember you saying when you first got on the bike you thought there was loads of power, but you were coming from the 250 and then you quickly realised that the, the factory guys maybe had a bit even more power. Yeah. And, um, but how did you find your rookie season in the class? Not always an easy jump to make, so I, I think you were pretty solid in your rookie season I would say. Yeah, I mean I had a couple of offers. I, ideally I wanted to stay in the MX2 class because I still had one year to go on the age limit, but I had a couple of offers. Um, whereby they wanted to do two-year deals with somebody and I couldn't do a two-year deal because I only had one year left in the class so that's when I switched my mindset over to let's go 450 I rode 2009 motocross of nations on a 450 at Francia Corta 
loved riding the 450 and I thought let's just go for it, let's go into MXGP now and start to serve my time as it were. LS Motors was great and bad at the same time, it was a privateer team, uh, very understaffed, under budgeted, but I had my dad and my brother working with me full time again, which I really enjoyed, you know, we, we kind of really knuckled down and got some good stuff done. As exactly what you said, I felt like there was loads of power on the Honda, and then I quickly realised when the races started that I was actually underpowered, and the budget that we had just didn't allow us to actually get any more power out of the engine, so I was stuck with that. And I was stuck with two setups on my suspension that I both felt equally good with, but one was very good for acceleration and one was very good for braking. We couldn't find something a happy oh, medium. Yeah. So I, I, I struggled a little bit that year, but I had such a blast. I got through that year unscathed, no injuries. Um, you know, my setup that year with my gear, with One Industries and everything, it looked, it looked pucker. I had a lot of fun, I had a lot of good results. I remember leading laps at Matterly Basin, uh, the home crowd was buzzing. It was, it was a really fun year, but on the flip side, getting paid was an issue. We ended up having to you know, wait months and months after the season had finished to get paid. So there's, there's all these things that people don't really see that, that goes on. But I, as a whole, looking back on it quickly, I had quite a fun year in my rookie season anyway. And I think one brand that sometimes I even forget that you were with was uh, Factory TM. <laughs> Just how unique is that bike? Obviously not in the paddock anymore, which is a bit of a shame, but... Was it a bike completely different than what you were used to? And obviously, it didn't really end that great for you, parting ways a few months into the season. But just how unique was that bike, really? It was. It was very interesting to see straight away. For me, the language barrier was an issue. You know, we don't speak Italian. Yeah. They they speak very good English, but a lot of things got lost in translation. We, again, I was stuck in a situation where the engine on that bike was very good one engine to another was very different. So they could build three engines the same and they felt very, very different. But they were good, very good on the hard pack, very torquey, and that I really enjoyed about it. But the chassis and the handling, I just could not get on with it at all. We tried lots of different stuff. We had parts breaking, the bike cut out on me a few times. Uh, the bike used that much fuel. We had to build a 13 and a half liter fuel tank out of aluminium for Valkensvar GP. And uh, it actually, it was that big, the fuel hose kinked and I didn't even manage to finish the GP because I, I didn't have any fuel. So uh, there was a lot of things that went on, but overall the actual factory experience and the factory tour and being down there in Italy was very interesting and hats off to them. They, those guys are running a serious operation down there, but at the highest level in GP racing, they were missing a few, few parts that year um, and I took the brunt of that. Uh, the years after that, they seemed to get their shit together a little bit more and seemed to kind of be finishing races and, and had their bike a little bit more set up. So it, it was a tough one, but probably the decision to ride for TM and, and part in company with them, um, you know, a third of the way into the season or halfway into the season was probably the trigger of the point in my career where I got on a Yamaha and that was the next chapter of my career. Yeah, well that was my next question. You ended that season with the privateer JK Yamaha team, another Italian based team, but you probably had maybe the best GP ever in Lerop. I mean, yeah. unbelievable. Uh, firstly, did you expect to win that GP? I mean, you were battling a Tonio <coughs> Crowley on a privateer bike, just unbelievable. Can you talk me through what it was like being with that team and that, that MX GP win? I think that was your first GP win as well, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, 2013. Mm -hmm. So, um, after a part of company with, with TM, you know, there was quite a few staff at TM and whatnot. JK Yamaha just basically gave me a nearly new bike and a completely shagged out bike. And they just said, see what you can do with those. They were more than happy just to let us run at our own devices, get the suspension done wherever we want, get the engine done wherever we want. And that's what we did. We went and got the engine tuned by Vollenberg Motorsport in Holland, who we knew well and worked with before. And it was our key to our success in 2008. He'd done all our engines then. And we tried very hard with the standard Yamaha suspension, but quickly couldn't manage to get a much of a set up there. And that's when we were some of the first people to ever put WP suspension in a Japanese bike at world championship level. And that just transformed it. When I had the engine and the suspension working right, I went from being sort of 12s and 10s straight up into the top five. And I was battling with the factory guys and it felt so easy to do. I was back in my 2008 feeling again. I was, it was that easy. I thought, how can it be this easy? What, what has happened? You know, and 
And you speak to anyone that wins races at any level, most of your race wins are some of the easiest races in your life. Some of them aren't, but quite often you really feel like it's easy and you're like, how the, like, how, why was that so easy today? And trying to replicate it is one of the most annoying things that you, you know, in a career that you can go through. Cause you, same thing for breakfast and do the same routine and all the rest of it and it doesn't work out. But some days it just clicks. In Leroc, I knew I was riding well. I'd been doing lots of sand practicing because I was living in Belgium. I just felt something I hadn't felt before in my entire life. And then we'll probably get onto it in a minute, but I felt it again a couple of times in my career. That morning or on the Saturday, I actually was interviewed and I said, there was, you know, it was wet and it was sandy. And I said, that was a lot how I was brought up in Scotland. Sandy tracks, wet. I said, something really special could happen this weekend. And it did. And I, it, there was something just, I felt it. I knew I was going to have a good weekend. I didn't know I was going to win, <laughs> but I knew I was going to be there or thereabouts. And probably your best days of your career with Roger McGee so a few years later you end, end up back with him uh, and you win Lommel which is amazing I'm sure you would have loved that but then the week after I think you went to America and yeah. you raced an AMA Nash. I think you only ever done one AMA yeah. Nash in your career so just taught me through that week really I mean going from the roughest track you can ride being all excited probably still hyped from the GP win but then you need to get game face on to go to America and then riding a the track is probably completely different to Lama yeah. just you taught me through that and what it was like racing in America it was it was a weird one getting back with Roger in 2014 was such a good building season we finished 7th in the world championship had a couple of podiums that year one being Lama uh, and we just figured the bike out we used 14 as like a let's get back on the map here and we were we were really solid 15 went amazing was up front all the time leading laps getting good starts again feeling comfortable with the bike and then Lomo came round and i just that's what i wanted to touch on about the Leroc thing this is the, that was the second time in my career that i woke up on sunday morning with my wife and as we left the house we took a selfie and i often look at that selfie and at that exact time at eight o'clock in the morning i knew i was going to win the gp that day I, don't, I can't tell you why I knew that, I just I felt that good about everything. My bike, my fitness, my program, everything was on point and it, it gave me goosebumps as I was leaving the house. I thought, this is going to be it, I'm going to win another one today. And it's, it's so insane to say it like that, I just knew it was going to happen. So we done that, it was always planned to go to Unadilla the week after Lommel, that was in the schedule, I knew there was a free weekend, so whether I'd won Lommel or not, I was going, you know, that was boots. But what a crazy week it was. We had to leave on the Tuesday after Lommel. Um, so much hype over the win at Lommel. Um, so much hype in America after me winning Lommel. You know, we rode in Unadilla, which is nothing like Lommel. I turned up there and off the back of the GP win, Factory KTM in America offered me to ride one of their bikes. Um, so they prepped me Ryan Dungey's practice bike, which in my opinion looked like brand new. Um, and I turned up there, put my stickers on, put my handlebars on, a seat, and we were ready to go. And I rode something that I hadn't even set up suspension-wise. They just put something in that they thought would be good for me, for my weight and speed. And uh, I think I really impressed a lot of people over there. You know, it would have been amazing to go over and win, you know, but like, I'm not this, I'm not like your Jeffrey Herlings or your Roman Febre who can go top results all the time. I was like a, peaking guy you know I peak for you know I do well at the ones I can do and then I can be a top five guy or a top ten guy depending on the day so going over there and finishing fourth overall was like it just blew me away I think I even you know I was definitely the best 450 KTM rider that day no I wasn't it's Dungy won um, but anyway it, it just really really impressed those guys and even now I seen them when I was over at Anaheim I went and met you know Ian Harrison and Roger DeCosta and all that and you know they just got this level of respect for you that you know had I went over and done rubbish they would probably been like oh, here's another guy that's just coming over and kind of wasting our time but I went over there with a the game face on and and managed to just harness all of this energy and it's probably what some you know, apart from my wife not being there which she still gives me shit about <laughs> probably the best two weeks of my entire life other than you know getting married and having chat having family and stuff I, from my racing career it was just like social media was blowing up every single day I was getting like hundreds of likes heaps of messages it was just you know there's probably Jeffrey and all that gets that all the time but like for me that was just like something I had never experienced and uh, it's funny you talk about respect there actually because 
I feel like, especially in America, you know, it's all about America, all about America, especially in those years. But I think probably Europe, you know, a European nation winning the motocross the nations for until Red Bull, obviously. Yeah. I think that's maybe changed a little, and the perception's different in America now. Whenever you were racing, did, did you maybe feel that GP riders didn't get the credit they maybe deserved, that, that they maybe get now? Did you ever feel that from the outside? Yeah, I think so. Definitely. You know, it's 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 not. You know, not easy to hide from. You know, the Americans are very, you know, outspoken, and you know, for a long time they just got their butts whipped. And and to be honest, you know, good enough for them. You know, but after being over to Anaheim and stuff, you know, I really, really respect how how impressive those guys are indoors. I mean, in Supercross tracks, like we think this is quite technical and tight and all the rest of it, but some of the stuff they ride is very impressive. Um, so you've got got to take your hat off to them for that as well. And. You know, they do 50-50, so they're, at, in my opinion, they're at a slight disadvantage because they come out of Supercross straight into motocross and the away they go, and then they start, you know, sort of learning their trade again throughout the year. But, you know, there's no doubt about it. America's a big place and they've got heaps of really good riders. So um, I do agree with you that the perception has changed now. You know, they've got a much more understanding of how hard we work in Europe, you know, especially through bad conditions, rough tracks. Uh, the gnarlier, the better for the Europeans, and the Americans definitely take their hat off to us for that. And motocross the nations, um, for a while, you did, never stood in the podium, and then Mark Chamberlain came in, and yeah, they all they all came <laughs> along at once. So, just can you tell me about some of your memories from that event? And I know that's an event you love, and yeah. so you, you must have a lot of good memories with that and stand on the podium. I think, again, coming from Scotland, I feel like my whole career, I've been at a slight disadvantage. You know, I feel the, the times that I've been on the team that I've easily warranted my spot, I feel really proud. The times where it's been touch and go and it's been me in, in, a, in a hat with a few other guys and you get selected, you feel like you've got to step up. You know, 2019 was a funny year because we had a couple of good guys that weren't available for the team and we ended up having to take myself, Nathan Watson and Adam Sterry. And probably before the, the weekend started, everyone was thinking, this is maybe not even your B team, this could be a C team here. And everyone was quite vocal about that. But, you know, I had a chat with the boys, me being probably one of the older ones there, or, or definitely the oldest uh, age-wise um, and experience-wise. And I said, let's just knuckle down, stick in, and you never know what can happen at these events. You know, it's such a lottery as well with the weather we got thrown as well. I said, Nathan had just come out of Enduro World Championships or whatever he was doing at that point. It was extreme Enduro or what. But, you know, everyone knew that he was, you know, doing the beach races and was, was right into getting stuck in. And Adam Sterry, again, he was in a good team and he, he, you know, he just grafts away. Again, not one of the most naturally talented guys out there, but just gives it everything he had. So... We just knuckled down. I had no idea where we were until I come over the, the finish line and Mark's given me the fist pumps and said, yeah, we made it. And oh, what an amazing feeling. You know, I, it's a different emotions to winning a GP. You know, it's a team race. Winning a GP is something you've done on your own. So probably slightly less in that respect, but especially because it's taken me so many attempts to get there and so many guys I've been on the team with before never made it onto the podium. Um, of course, it would have been lovely to win one of these things, but you know, going up against the Yanks and the French and the Italians and every single year, it's you know we're going to be at a disadvantage having such a small country that we live in. It's uh, you know what an achievement it really was. One of those things in my career that I hadn't checked off, and that was that done then because we got on the podium. And just the here and now, really, um, you're obviously these days not racing MXGP anymore. You've sort of transitioned for this year anyway. Uh, a rider and a team manager, so to speak. How do you find being away from MXGP and racing in England? Like, how, how do you find that? Because obviously you've raced GPs since you were like 15 or whatever, so how do you find the motivation just to ride the British? And how many years do you see this going on for in terms of racing? I think deep down, like last year was my first year just doing the British Championships, Scottish Championships, Select MX Nationals, rode in France a couple of times. I genuinely didn't miss the MXGP at all. You know, there were some years like 2014, 2015, where I was with Roger, and we had really good results, don't get me wrong, and it really paid off, but those years felt like two years. It was that much hard work. No one will ever understand how much work me and my dad put in, just the two of us, nobody else to help us. It, 
it really the GPs have really started taking a toll on me. And then I, I've got a young family now, got married, got a young family. So being away from home during COVID, running my own team, struggling to get sponsors, it just it wasn't A, it wasn't paying anymore. B, I was spending so much time away from my family and C, I wasn't getting the results I felt like I warranted or deserved or or could get. So it just wasn't it wasn't feasible anymore. It was so expensive to do MXGP, traveling all over the world. I just wanted to stay at home and be with my kids and my wife and base myself in Scotland where I've not based myself properly since I was 16 years old. So, you know, most years from when I was 16 till I was 33, we would be in Scotland for two to maybe three months a year. The rest of the nine months of the year, we'd be in Belgium. So, I, I never got to see some of the trees in my garden in full blossom. <laughs> and I never really got to cut my grass at home. You know, I, it's stuff like that that, like, you know, in, in my mid-thirties now, I'm really enjoying about being at home. So, my kids are nearly starting school, um, or my little boy is, so just being there for the school run in the morning, you know, I don't want to miss those things, you know. And I still feel like I'm competitive in the UK. I do genuinely feel like I can get another title under my belt, but it will be tough. You know, I'm not getting any younger. I'm definitely thinking more when I'm riding these days. Um, I've had my fair share of injuries along the way and, and I don't really want to be getting injured anymore. You know, that's just, just how it is. Um, so, a lot more methodical, a lot more thought goes into things and, you know, if, if this new bike, the way I'm feeling on it right now, if, I think if we can get everything dialed on it, we can have a real good chance at, at trying to shoot for the title. Obviously, Tommy and Harry have been the two main guys for the last couple of years, so I need to put it up in there and mix it with them. We've obviously got Josh and Conrad and and a few other guys in the mix, but I think you know it's definitely going to make for a good race, and, and and hopefully we can all have a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, and last question, you'll be glad to know. Um, I quite enjoyed it, a bit of reminiscing. <laughs> Whenever uh, <coughs> you do hang up the motocross boots, do you oh, see? I never your... answered your question about how much longer you think. Oh well, yeah, uh, well that one. I don't know. Uh, I'm just taking it year by year. Yeah. Uh, well, um, whenever you do hang boots up. Do you see yourself staying in the sport? Obviously, you're with this Gabriel team now, so maybe staying in a team manager role. Or I think you'd be quite a good coach. Is that something you'd, you'd go into, coach or training? I think I, I, I genuinely think I can turn my hand to a lot of things. I'm quite technic, technical on the bikes. I do a lot of the work on my bikes myself. Um, you know, I've learned a lot of things over the years. I also think I'd be good at coaching. I also think I'd be a good team manager. But I need to decide what it is I want to do. And I, I don't see being a team manager for the next 10 years of my life after I hang up my boots. Maybe two or three years, maybe five years, could be. But this is a stepping stone for me to figure out if that's something I want to do. You know, I'm still riding and racing at a very high level in the UK. And if I can manage and, and you know do everything that I need to do for, for our team, then uh, and I, I can enjoy it while Tristan and, and Taylor do some GPs, because that's ultimately what Simon from Gabriel wants to do. Um, he would like to have a GP team within right. the next couple of years. So there is a spot there open for me to, to, to continue on if everything goes well. Um, it's whether or not I can sacrifice that time away from home, my wife and my kids, um, doing something I used to do and not doing it myself. You know, while I get the same enjoyment out of managing a team, then I, you know, I could warrant the time away because I was racing. But if you're getting paid to be a race racer or paid to be a team manager, hell of a lot safer being a team manager. You know, at least I can come home on a Monday and fly out on a Friday or whatever. You know, um, and still make money. Essentially, I've certainly not made enough money in my career to sit down and just chill out for a few yeah, years. Yeah, I will need to get a job, um, but I don't see myself going to get a nine to five somewhere. So I'll probably, I'll stick within the sport yeah, for another few years. That's yet. good to know, it's just good to see you in the sport. And just the last, last question. Last, uh, last. Last, last <laughs> question. Uh, Tristan and Taylor are obviously going to do a few GPs this year. Is there any chance you might do, we could be tempted into like even one wild card ride or even the British Grand Prix? Yeah, it's went through my mind and I've been asked the same question by, by a few friends and, and people, uh, my wife in, in particular. Um, <laughs> but I would only go if I felt like I could go and do myself justice. I wouldn't go, Just not, to make the up the num not to make up the numbers, I don't want to go around and finish 20th because everyone that's at the GP is going to think, why would he come back and do that? I want to go and have a real good shot at it. If I feel comfortable, if I feel like I'm riding good, if I feel safe and fit, then I will give one a go, and it will be a sandy one. 
Blommel or, or Arnhem or something. But until that point comes in the season, I won't know. It'll be a last-minute thing if it does happen.